Good morning, everybody. We will continue with our uh, discussions on uh, philosophy of education um, in attempting to get better conceptual clarity. Today we will be inquiring into social justice, what are the issues related to it in current uh, schooling context and uh, the normative aspect of how teacher can address these issues. So, the objectives of today's lesson would be to understand schooling as a factor in perpetuating inequities, reflecting on issues related to curriculum and implementation on social justice and appreciating the role of a teacher in addressing these social justice issues. I quote a few uh, philosophers uh, who worked in the area of social justice. Social justice is a philosophically contested and normative concept. This is what Goodlett has said. But then Rawls says that justice is the first virtue of social institutions. That being the case, schooling is a social institution and it has to directly address social justice issues. But despite a policy of affirmative action in our country since our independence, and constitutional provisions being there. Schooling has not been able to address social justice issues as effectively as it should have. The National Curriculum Framework 2005 had come out with uh, position papers and uh, quite a few of them talk about these issues. They directly address the problems that face Indian schools and uh, also provide solutions for them. And the curriculum and the implementation that NCF 2005 suggests offers solutions in terms of better addressing the social justice issues. And I quote uh, from the curriculum framework here, despite over three decades of commitment to equality and universalization of education, the ground realities are still grim especially in the context of the marginalized groups and girls from rural areas. So, how does school perpetuate inequities? If we look at studies after studies that are being conducted in our country for the past 40-50 years, specifically in the area of sociology of education. We find that uh, the learning outcomes of uh, children from certain castes and communities are way below the national uh, average, similarly for Adivasi children and uh, children from urban deprived uh, communities, specifically uh, the street children the children of migrant workers, slum and pavement dwellers. So, a lot needs to be achieved in terms of shortening the achievement gap of these children. And of course, children with disabilities. Despite India being a signatory of the Salamanca Declaration and having adopted uh, inclusive education in our country for quite a long time, when it comes to the learning achievement, these children are getting integrated, they are being included in mainstream schooling, but in terms of learning achievement of these children, still a lot more needs to be done. Now, uh, one of the biggest factor that acts as a barrier in schools is the negative attitudes that we carry. And it is not just the teachers, because teachers form a part of the community. These negative attitudes primarily arise from a lack of knowledge. We all share uh, assumptions of what it means to be normal and uh, these ideas are not questioned or even explicitly thought about. I would like to share an example with you of uh, engaging a group of student teachers. These student teachers were given a um, case study wherein a group of girls had written about uh, 
what they wanted to be in uh, five years time. And a uh, lot of these girls understandably so because they were 19 and 20 years old, um, they wanted to get married and settle down. Um, but they had also mentioned that uh, if when they work, their uh, hmm, husband and uh, parents-in-law must be understanding and uh, they must permit them to visit their parents uh, once in a while and uh, in case they get delayed at work, they should give them permission. And uh, during the discussion that followed uh, this reading, mm -hmm. none of the girls uh, in the class found anything odd about uh, the write-up. It took one boy to point it out, why do girls need permission? Um, you know, he said, uh, yes, you have to inform, there has to be mutual respect between the wife and the husband and uh, his parents, of course. But for you to wait for permission, to seek the permission to visit your own parents simply does not make sense in this day and age. It was only then that the girls uh, started pondering about it, till such time they did not even think it was unnatural for them. So, this was one uh, example of a stereotype. Um, study findings show that some of the other assumptions include uh, stereotypes of lack of academic ability of certain groups of children and uh, parents being responsible for the poor academic performance of children from the economically weaker sections. This is primarily because we willy nilly project um, middle class uh, values of raising children onto these uh, parents as well, who live in a very, very different uh, sort of a world. So, the other stereotypes include uh, children with disabilities cannot cope with the regular curriculum in the mainstream classrooms and they need special schools and they need to be segregated or that other children um, uh, may not be comfortable being with children who look and behave differently. So, there are studies that show that these stereotypes are quite deep ridden among the teachers, because a study is conducted on teachers, definitely these perpetuate in the society also, in the communities also. Then other than these stereotypes, the other barriers include labeling of children as slow learners school after school that we visit, teachers happily label children, uh, these, these children are slow learners, right in front of the mm, children, they point them out. And uh, the <coughs> position paper on the problems of uh, scheduled caste and scheduled tribe children point out that um, teachers place an undue obsession with language purity and correctness. Um, so, mainstream language expects certain accents. The dialects may not be conducive to these uh, accents and these ways of pronouncing certain words, but uh, mm. teachers are very insistent that the correct pronunciations be made. Of course, children need to learn the correct pronunciation, I am not denying that, but that can come at a later stage, not when they have just entered school and they are getting used to the school ethos, to the academic ethos and beginning to learn language in a formal sense. So, at that point in time, it is far more important that children are given space to express themselves rather than correcting them constantly. And of course, the rampant use of corporal punishment despite there being a law against it. Corporal punishment also arises because of a strong held notion that uh, learning is an unnatural process and uh, children need strict disciplinary measures to learn. And uh, most teachers tell me that uh, um, you know, my teachers have uh, punished me, they have hit me, 
and I am what I am because of that. Um, and they actually um, think they are doing good to children by uh, using corporal punishment. Professor Krishna Kumar, who was the director of uh, NCRT at the time National Curriculum Framework 2005 was uh, developed, has pointed out that uh, schooling has been a factor in perpetuating inequities and uh, following insensitive pedagogies and ill thought out curricula. And this apart from the range of schools that exist in our country offering uh, a schooling experience to different strata of the society and uh, these range of schools have differing qualities. Now the right of children to free and uh, compulsory education act the RTE act 2009 is an attempt to ensure that every child in the age group of 6 to 14 years receives quality education and the parameters of quality are clearly spelt out in the act. The national curriculum framework 2005 and the related position papers that I spoke to you earlier about, they have certainly widened the discourse on uh, curricular issues and more importantly they stress on meaning making and it places the onus on teachers to ensure that every child in her class is able to meaningfully experience the schooling experiences. So, the schools today have children with very diverse needs who come from very diverse backgrounds and who need a diverse set of uh, implementation strategies and a variety of resources to cater to their needs in order to be able to meaningfully participate in the schooling process. Education fosters development in a child definitely and uh, within the school context it is the teachers who are the key players in making learning meaningful to all the children. And the term all as I just mentioned now implies that no two uh, children are similar and obviously they have different needs and require different inputs. Therefore, teachers need to accept and respect diversity among their learners. They need to critically reflect on issues of discrimination and consciously attempt to adapt inclusive pedagogies and strive to create an inclusive learning environment. Of course, the society is extremely stratified and uh, as we have seen there are uh, deeply ridden prejudices within the society itself, but the teacher still has to soldier on at least within her class she has to ensure that all children's needs are met and these kinds of discriminatory attitudes are not brought within the school premises. So, how does a teacher create a inclusive learning environment that promotes social justice in schools? If you look at the presentation, it says teachers need to conceptually understand diversity from the perspectives of pedagogical needs, physical needs, sensorial needs, intellectual needs, sociological needs, cultural needs. That is quite a lot for any teacher to address. So, that is what teacher education uh, programs attempt to do by bringing in uh, studies related to sociology of education, studies related to the philosophy of education, the psychology courses, all these courses are uh, meant to equip you to address all these needs. 
but primarily what every teacher has to believe is that all children can and will learn so this is a belief that all of us as teachers need to strongly imbue in ourselves so generally there's a tendency for teachers to say i taught uh, i did my best but uh, the children didn't learn so we can't wash our hands off if we taught and the children didn't learn then it means we have not done enough and our teaching has not reached the students exactly additionally teachers also have to be aware of uh, our own beliefs and assumptions about children's uh, socio economic uh, backgrounds and uh, their abilities so these are the stereotypes that we carry um, as uh, part of the members of communities that we belong to and we have to develop sensitivity to children's diverse needs especially those from marginalized communities so this is where reflection helps we saw in the previous uh, session uh, how it is important to be a reflective practitioner so these kinds of uh, hidden assumptions within ourselves when we share it in a larger group of diverse teachers um there is a chance that these assumptions would be addressed by someone else because they are so deeply hidden in us we may not be aware of them ourselves of those biases so sharing um and uh, the process of have engaging ourselves in dialogues with other uh, teachers and colleagues will help bring these uh, assumptions to the fore and teachers alone cannot address the problems that uh, a country faces um, especially the social justice issues although she does play a crucial role within the classroom the system also has to support her the system has to ensure that the intent and purpose of policy if you look at a policy documents um they are all for social justice they are all for ways and means of addressing issues of social justice but the system has to help teachers and the institutions also be it the schools or the teacher education institutions or the higher education institutions to implement these policies in an effective manner and for that to happen these policies have to be contextualized and the contextualization can happen only when the stakeholders are involved in the process and uh, i spoke about this yesterday also teachers have to be provided with non threatening spaces and uh, support in multiple aspects to make education for social justice a reality so in a highly stratified society like ours and it's based on vertical uh, hierarchies education definitely offers a glimmer of hope and teachers do play a crucial role but as i said earlier she can't do it alone the system and the larger society has to support her in this endeavor हेलो मैम आई एम कातिया इन दो डाइवर्सिटी कैन बी कंस्ट्रक्टिव एट टाइम्स एंड देर आर अदर टाइम्स वेर इट कैन बी डिस्ट्रक्टिव एज वेल एंड देर विल बी सिचुएशन वेर वन पार्टी ऑफन वॉन्ट्स टू स्ट्रांगली अपोज द व्यूज ऑफ द अदर पार्टी वेर इट कैन लीड टू एडवर्स इफेक्ट्स ओके आई थिंक योर रेस्पॉन्स इज कमिंग फ्राम द पोलिटिकल पार्टीज डिबेट्स uh that we see on television uh, on almost a daily basis now um so i'm glad that at least some of you think that uh, diversity is a strength going back to your uh, question on how do we minimize uh, difference no two um, human beings are uh, alike so we are different by nature so the question is does schooling 
want to road roll these differences and make us all uh, into people who do things alike and who behave like robots is that what we want our schooling to do or should we look at diversity itself as a strength and harness those diverse uh, ideas and views that come across and respect each other's differences of opinions. Do you think that would be a better uh, way of looking at diversity rather than attempting to minimize diversity? So hopefully when we build a culture of mutual respect of most importantly listening to each other's views even if those views are very different from ours. So hopefully the, the assemblies and the parliament of future will listen to better informed uh, debates and the studio TV television studio debates are also respectful of each other's uh, views and actually listen to each other's uh, opinions. So maybe schools of today can uh, promote that kind of uh, healthy democratic discussion that our country did see in the early years of independence. It is only now that we have reached this stage that is worrying you primarily. Hello ma'am, my name is Ruth. In the session you have already told that every child in the class should have meaningful experiences. Will you please elaborate which kind of meaningful experiences a child can have ma'am? I would again like to pose this question back to you. What do you mean by meaning? When we say we have understood the meaning of something or when we say that this particular experience was meaningful for us, what do we mean by that? Ma'am, what I think uh, it meaning actually means is uh, when it is able to bring some change in our uh, thinking or our behavior, uh, like if I had a opinion earlier, if that opinion is changed to a better version, then I uh, I can say that it had made some meaning to my life or to my view. Excellent. That's one way of looking at meaning. But do we all dramatically change our view with just one experience, um, or if somebody tells us once to change? Does that happen? No, no. It rarely happens, isn't it? Yes. So changing in uh, our behavior takes time, changing in our uh, thinking uh, takes even more time. So primarily here by what I mean is that we make sense of what we see, what we do, what we hear, what we read. And again, what do we mean by making sense? It means we are able to connect it with what we already know, with our knowledge from previous experiences, with our ideas and thoughts that we have gained already. So if we are able to make that connection with whatever we see, do, hear, read, what we learn on a daily basis. So when we make that connection, then we can say that it makes sense to us. So when it makes sense, we are able to make meaning out of it. Unfortunately, what is happening in schools is that what we are taught in school as part of the curriculum is so diverse from our everyday experiences. So we just learn that for the sake of learning, if it can be called learning at all. So it is mostly by rote. We write the exam, we forget about it pretty soon. So that is not meaning making. Meaning making implies connections in all the experiences that we gain through the process of schooling. These connections we automatically make when we are in out of school context, even when we are playing or when we are talking to our neighbors or in our actions at home. 
So, there we are making sense of what we are doing automatically. Here, because this the kind of knowledge that the school promotes is a specialized knowledge, the teacher's responsibility to ensure that those uh, connections are made obvious for the child. The responsibility of making meaning of course, lies with the child, that the teacher has to facilitate that process of meaning making. So, that is why it is important for her to know the diverse needs of children, know the socio-cultural background of the children, so that these connections that she makes are relevant for the children to make sense of. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes ma'am. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.